Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming out. This is great. I'm so glad that there are so many people here and staying long enough to listen to all this ridiculous, nerdy uh, talks. Um, mine is very short, so uh, I won't keep you too much longer before the QA session and such. Um, I just basically want to go over like a quick summary of like what it is that I work on and uh, how we use it here at Carrot, where I work. So, um, it's a static site generator like many others. Um, it's called Spike, and this is a little potted cactus in a desert because that makes sense. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so Spike is is drastically different from Gatsby in that it is it's very bare bones and it's very unbiased. Um, the reason for that is that uh, here at Carrot we are an agency, and so we get a huge variety of different types of work from tiny projects to giant ones, uh, projects that are finished after a month to ones that we will hand off to other teams of developers that prefer specific technology. Um, and so we need our tools to be exceedingly uh, unbiased and flexible to fit whatever needs uh, the next project that comes in our door is. Um, so Spike is particularly flexible in that manner so that we know we don't have to pick and choose different tools for every project, but we can build everything on a single foundation that uh, starts without having too many opinions, and we can build opinions as the projects come. Um, Spike is honestly just Webpack. Uh, <laughs> it just is extended a little bit, but Webpack only bundles JavaScript, and with Spike you kind of forced it to to output everything else too. So but by default, you would usually set up a Webpack configuration to like pull in all your different JavaScript files of any type, compile them in some manner perhaps, uh, and then output them. And so the only difference in Spike is that it will do the same thing for any type of other static files. So rather than giving it one entry point to where your start of your JavaScript goes and then requiring files from there, um, you will just run it in the root of a folder, and it will read through the file tree in your folder, pick out your HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and then put those through the Webpack pipeline and compile them out, uh, you know, as they are through any loaders, plugins, whatever other Webpack stuff you want. Um, so it, it is Webpack, and it just extends it a little bit further, um, meaning that any Webpack plugin will work out of the box. Any Webpack loader will work out of the box. Uh, any Webpack default <coughs> configuration values, you could put into Spike's configuration file, and it will work as you expected. Maybe like 98%. <laughs> there are a couple of things slightly different. Uh, um, the other thing that we really strive to uh, build Spike around is what I call plugin platforms. I don't really know if there's like a better name for these, because I just made the top of this name. Like, randomly, but um, the theory is that you will have languages like SAS, which are like, here's SAS, here are all the features that SAS has. Uh, you take all these features and you use them. Um, and then you have other sort of projects like PostCSS, which are like, here's PostCSS, it doesn't do anything at all by default, but you can add in plugins as you want to make specific transforms to your CSS and you can add and remove the plugins you want. And so that latter model that PostCSS is based on uh, is something that we really enjoyed a lot, especially when you think about the flexibility required that I was talking about at the beginning. We really need to be able to shift to any kind of need. So being able to push and pull plugins and kind of like have any of our uh, files written in any way that we need it to be at any time is super attractive for us. Um, and so that's kind of what we build all of our stuff on. So post CSS is there in the corner with that weird like cult logo. Uh, <laughs> Dupable is something that everyone uses already. Uh, but while most people consider it to just be like that thing that turns ES6 into like actually working, um, it is a plugin platform. So you can write a Babel plugin that will take JavaScript and transform the abstract syntax tree in any way that you please. Uh, and output it like that. So you see how JSX is transformed, you see how ES6 is transformed, and if you peek inside of any of the uh, Babel presets, you'll find that they are just a big, big list of like, 
here's every feature of ES6, and here's how it gets transformed down to ES5, right? Um, and then reshape is the last one, and probably nobody's heard of this, uh, because we made it, and we haven't marketed it at all. <laughs> uh, someday we will, but this is the same exact thing as these two, but it's for HTML. So it will parse your HTML, um, it will expose to you an abstract syntax tree of the HTML, you slot in a plugin for any transforms you want, and then it will compile out to normal HTML. <laughs> so you could do like a Jade-like or Pug syntax that comes down to HTML, you can do some other crazy kind of syntax, you can do layouts, includes, like any kind of stuff that you want. Um, but you pick each feature piecewise and you slot them as a whole. Um, so this is a really important piece for us, and these are all the defaults for Spike, and so it's something that um, we really encourage our users to embrace uh, rather than just replace them with something else, which they can do, by the way, if they, if they want to, because we need to be able to do it. Um, the other thing that we kind of like are really strict about as far as our defaults is adhering to web standards. Um, the reason for this is because uh, anyone who's been kind of programming and doing web stuff for a long time will recognize that there have been many frameworks over time that have come and go, and they've been the super hotness, and then suddenly they're garbage and nobody wants to use it, and, <laughs> and it's a legacy. Um, and we really don't like getting burned by that <laughs> stuff, so we prefer to stick with technologies that like, we know are not going to go from being the hotness to not being the hotness anymore, and now nobody's using it, and anyone we hire doesn't understand how to develop with it. So anytime there's a web standard that we could use and build upon, we'll use that because we're confident that if we build a site on top of this, uh, it will be something that people understand far into the future and will never be something you need to migrate off of onto, onto something else. Um, and so obviously ES6 is a big piece of that, which everyone knows already. Um, for CSS, we use CSS Next out of the box, which is a post-CSS plugin that includes a lot of uh, proposals from the CSS working group uh, spec to kind of like implement things that you will be able to use in the browser, but for now they need to get compiled. Um, and for HTML, there are not quite as many innovations happening on that route right now, but we're absolutely ready for them uh, with reshape, and as soon as something kind of comes out, there's one guy who proposed a H element that's not like H1 or H2 or whatever, but it's any heading, and so he made a reshape plugin for that. Um, that, that looks at how deeply it's nested and then transforms it into H with a number, which is cool. So we're ready, we're keeping an eye on HTML, we're ready for that. Uh, imports and stuff are, are on the radar, but uh, there's not quite as much exciting what's happening with like JavaScript, for example. Um, so... Actually, on that front, how about the yes. picture, like the picture element or source set for images? Yep, we have a picture one that we're working on right now that will take like a very abbreviated syntax and it will spit out like a bunch of different sources for source set and sizes. Yeah, that was the one that we saw right away. Once there's like these giant picture elements all over source, which there are, uh, we're like, this got, this has got to get abbreviated. So we will have an element for that too. Um, and just basically anything you want to kind of abbreviate in a portable manner. You can take these plugins and just slot them into any project. Reshape is not tied to Spike or any of our tools at all. It's its own thing. It sits by itself. So you can use it if you want. Um, check it out. It's pretty stable. We've used it like in production a lot, so I think it's okay. <laughs> um, the last thing is this kind of like progressive workflow idea, which is that we don't give you like too much um, out of the box. We kind of just give you like the bare bones and you can build it from there as you please. And this is something that is not necessarily a good thing for everybody. Um, you know, sometimes you want to take a set of really great defaults out of the box and go with that. But for us, since we have a lot of variety, we really need to start with like something that's basic and then build up whatever we need on top of that. Um, and so I wanted to show like a demo. Really which obviously will be a huge disaster because that's how a lot of things are. <laughs> um, so, I've got, is this visible? Yeah. Um, so I have these three projects and they're called, <laughs> they're called Spike Basic and Spike Absolute Basic 
And then I have one client project that we worked on recently that's like very complicated. Um, so is this like visible to everyone? Can everyone see this okay? So I'll start with Spike Absolute Basic. So Spike Absolute Basic consists of HTML, JavaScript, CSS. It has a yarn file I used to install my modules. It's got a package JSON because you need that to install my modules. And then it's got this app.js file. Um, and that's all we have in the project. And you can see the app.js file is a webpack configuration. You have your entry, and it just points to our main JavaScript file. And then I just have a couple of ignores because I don't want to output my like metadata files. So if I drop the command line, you can see it did this already. This runs spike compile. Uh, then it'll do its thing. And it will say it's compiled, give you how much time it did. And then inside of public, you get index.html, you get this JavaScript file. I don't know why it's not showing up. It is, this is a webpack, so you can see that it's extended webpack. In this particular case, it's a little bit silly to have all the webpack vertically um, here. Sorry. But for most normal sites, uh, the boilerplate will justify this <laughs> <laughs> one console log that I have here. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. This is not like ridiculous. <laughs> um, and then I just have this CSS file, which came through as it was, right? So the basics of Spike are that like it's not inaccessible to anybody. Like this is not hard to write this code. It's not hard to understand what this code does. It's just three files and one configuration file, and like a Giddy bar and like a yarn install file. You know, so this is what you can do and like how you can start if you want to. Um, it doesn't impose anything upon you. Uh, there's Spike Absolute Basic. <laughs> Here's Spike Basic. So in this one, my site's getting a little bit bigger. I wanted to kind of separate away my files. So I have these assets, and I have the CSS folder, I have the JavaScript folder, I have this views folder. And here I have a layout. This is very fancy. You know, it's going to shock you guys. So you can see that in this we have a little bit of like reshape logic. Uh, this is what appears to be an HTML5 custom element, but it's not. It just gets compiled out. Reshape kind of just like will let you do anything. So this particular plugin for layouts will take uh, these two elements and transform them in a specific manner. So we extend the layout file. We have a content block. There's some, some basic stuff right there. And then here's our layout. We've got our head, we've got the meta stuff, uh, we've got style sheets, uh, and then you know, here is our block where the top is in there. Okay? Not the most complicated product you've ever seen. This is not blowing anybody's minds, but it's more complicated than the last one. Right? Uh, so if I go into Spike Basic, I compile it. See what we get in the result. All right, the label loader is deprecated, unfortunately, right now. Oh, and this is our config. Sorry. So there's a couple more things in here. This still is a webpack config. There's the webpack after the stuff. Here's the same ignore as I got a couple more files in the ignores. Um, now I have this configuration block for reshape with CSS and data, like I was talking about. Nothing too crazy here. We have a couple of different modules we wrapped up in a like standards like preset package that are like layouts, uh, partials, just essentially like the basic stuff you need to make an HTML page. And same with post CSS, we have CSS next in there and imports so that you can run as a CSS import. And this stuff is just uh, they will preset it. <laughs> and in public, we have this lovely structure here as expected. You go out to your HTML here with a full layout. You have again a JavaScript file, and you have a source map out here. You have a webpack. You can see the of this. And then you have CSS. So here's like still a super basic project, but like now there's a little more structure, there's a little more config, and we've run all of our files through like some basic parts of um, it, like layouts and stuff. Um, and then the last one is this, this client project we've been working on. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of this, but like this is a really complicated project. Uh, and you can see in the configuration file, there's a lot of plugins being pulled in here. Uh, where we use Contentful for this project because we love Contentful. 
Uh, and so we're pulling in this like you know, these tokens. We're, we're running all the content, pulling it into our locals, uh, caching it through JavaScript. Um, we've got some custom loader rules here coming in from Webpack that will like compile view templates in a specific way that we need in order to render our single page app. Um, we've got some vendor scripts that don't need to be compiled that go through. Um, I, I use the object fit property in Polyfill that and it's a great time. Um, I define variables into Webpack. We have the bundle analyzer, so like you can go really, really deep into it uh, with Spike if you want to, and make very complicated projects that work exactly the way you want. Uh, but the key is that you don't have to, <laughs> you know? So you can take what you need from it and, and push it into the direction that you want uh, without being forced in any particular direction, uh, which is one of the reasons it's so valuable to us. Here's some of the JavaScript in here. This is massive. I mean, we've got a ton of components. We've got a ton of pages. Got a lot of polyfills. This is our entry point. You can see we have ES, ES module syntax here, full um, ES6 stuff. So that's all I wanted to show essentially for that. It's just like kind of the range that you can go through as far as like how complex it is. Um, that's all I really had to say. It's production ready. We've been using this for our projects here at Carrot for client work for more than a year at this point. Um, it's good to go. We just pushed a stable release uh, this week, which is great, but it was kind of stable before that. It was more of like, a, like oh, probably we should just go to 1.0 because we've been using it in production for a long time. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's ready. We put out a lot of sites on it. It's very exciting. Uh, and that's all. Thank you so much for listening to me.